Yannick. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here to present this work. So uh, the work I will show has essentially been done at uh, the Institute for Light and Matter in Lyon since seven years. Um, and uh, so I will speak about this inelastic light scattering and I would add something, it's that I will speak about low frequency inelastic light scattering. And first of all, uh, as it's a lecture, I want to present this topic, the context of this measurement. I will show what is low frequency for me, uh, how to measure it, and uh, what are these acoustic variations of nanoparticles, and then I will show you some examples of that. So low frequency range, so you all know that frequency uh, is uh, defining vibrations and everything is vibrating from the biggest star to the smallest object as molecules. And uh, there is different types of vibration, vibration of the object as a wall and also bone vibrations. And uh, where is the low frequency range here? Um, you, as you can see, the size of this object is quite different. There's really big things, really small things, and the frequency of vibration will depend on the size of the object. It's inversely proportional to that. So I show some example here. And uh, when I tell you low frequency, you will say me that it's kilohertz and megahertz. So it's not exactly this in my case. Uh, and um, it depends on the domain we consider. So the school is on uh, light and sound uh, uh, interaction. So if we consider lights, the low frequency range, it's uh, radio waves between 30 and 300 kilohertz. If we consider sounds, it's down this frequency range. It's around between 20 and 20, 20 kilohertz. But what I will show you, it's inelastic light scattering, which means that I use light uh, to detect vibration. So that means that I will have a reference. This is my, my light, mostly in a visible range in, uh, in our case. And I will consider the frequency of vibration with respect to this uh, frequency. Okay. So you all know that Raman frequency is between 3 and 60 terahertz. It's just a definition. And you have then the brilliant light scattering, which are acoustic waves. So this is the low frequency range, and in particular, it's the same frequency range for the nanoparticles we will study. Okay. But how to measure these frequencies with light? It's uh, really low frequency. One gigahertz is lo quite low. So if you look at the guitar, you can uh, use your ear. It's not my case or you can use a microphone or electronics. But in the case of nanoparticles, it's really low frequency or high frequency in that case for sound. We will use light. So when you shine the sample with light, you will have elastic scattering. You, you've already seen that before. And you have also part of the light which is inelastic, inelastically scattered. And you can detect the uh, loss or gain of energy uh, due to the vibration inside the materials. The first experiment was performed by Raman, who got the Nobel Prize in 1930. And this, this was his first experiment. Okay, so he used a mercury arc lamp, blue filter. So that means its light source was something like that. Okay. The lights travel through the liquid benzene and then he used an uh, Adam Inglow spectroscope and he obtained such uh, spectra. So you see here that there is a clear difference and it was quite clever to know that there is something new here uh, that happens and it shows that this secondary radiation is really important. And uh, in his noble lectures, Raman tells already that this field is really important because you will have many information using Raman spectroscopy on the chemical constitution of the system. And as he told, there is practically unrestricted scope in studying the problems relating to the structure of nature. And I will show you that we can use this technique for many, many things. But in my case, I will not use such experiment. It mo it's as I need to detect things that are quite smaller than him. 
So the energy we will uh, detect is between 4 micro EV and 100 milli EV um, in the range of the nanoparticle vibrations. And I will measure it with light. So that means that I will measure photons, I me will measure f wavelengths, and here I will just make a, a, a short uh, definition of, of the units because people asked me before. So you know we use wave numbers, EV, nanometers, frequency. So this is simply the reason is that it if you use uh, um, the laser light, so we will use 532 nanometers in absolute wave numbers, it's this number. And uh, when you do an elastic like scattering, you will measure with respect to this line. So generally we use these wave numbers because it's homogeneous to uh, a frequency and to the energy, it's proportional to that. So we can measure it. And here I attract your attention, so I will measure down to 100 wave numbers and I will go down to 1 gigahertz, 0 0.03 uh, wave numbers, that means something less than 1 picometer. So I have to resolve wavelengths that are separated by 1 uh, picometers. So there is picometers that are able to do that, but the other point is that we use a uh, laser line, so you have the relay scattering, which is quite intense. And that means that what you have to resolve is something really small, and this is not at a good scale, but really close to the relay line. So to do that, we have to filter the relay scattering, and the best way is to use a, a grating. If you use only one grating, you have a rejection that is quite good, and in our case, but it's not enough of what we want to do, in our case, we were using five gratings, so this is our old spectrometers, uh, it's I don't know, 25 years old. It's still used uh, and it allows us to have good results. It's, well, it's five monochromators, six slits, uh, focal length is 800 millimeters. So we have a resolution of about 20 picometer with this spectrometer. And we are able to go down quite uh, small frequencies. So this is five wave number, 150 gigahertz, okay? In a good condition, and if you think about the geometry of your experiment, you can also access lower frequency down to two wave numbers, for example. But the problem of such spectrometers is that it's a point-by-point -point acquisition. Each on each point, you rotate your grating. You wait about 30 seconds per point. So this spectra is something like 12 hours, something like that. Okay, so it's quite long. But the good point is also that you can use all the wavelengths you want with the system. So you don't need not filter specific to the wavelengths. But Ara showed us yesterday that now there is some new uh, uh, filters that exist, this volume holographic bright grating that might be used with only one grating, so there is much more photons. You can use a CCD and you can then make spectra really faster. It's quite interesting. You see here a spectra they give on, on their website. This is on DAX, I think. Uh, so they are able to resolve down to 10 wave numbers, something like that. But it's this spectra is one second. It's really fast. Too. And I will use it. Uh, some of the results I will show have been performed with that. But I want to go uh, at lower frequency. I told you one gigahertz. So I also use. Uh, Fabry Perot interferometers. So it is based on a, a Fabry Perot etalons separated with air. You have two mirrors. When you send uh, the wavelengths and sizes, if the distance is correct, you will have a transmission. And once you have two times the distances, you will have again a transmission. This is next order. So you don't want this order because you want to measure something here. And uh, this spectrometer was built by. Uh, John Sandokok, uh, I don't know, 40 years ago, I think. And he used two uh, etalons with slightly different distances in between, just putting an angle here. And like this, you have only the central order that is, uh, uh, that is transmitted and the others are killed by the two uh, um, etalons. And in reality, the, the clever idea of John was to use this uh, 
many times, so if there is six paths inside the, the, the etalons that are here, so you pass six paths here, so you have almost nothing uh, um, in that range. So you have a rejection, a contrast between the relay line and the, the, the frequency you measure that is about 10 to the 19, I think, now in the new setup. So with this, we are able to measure really low frequency. So this is how we do a performance spectra. We just scan the distances between the two mirrors. So this is also a point by point uh, uh, spectrometer. So this is a spectra of uh, 50 nanometer gold nanoparticles. And uh, we are able to access frequency down to one gigahertz. Indeed, you need a really good laser to do that. If your laser uh, has a width of 20 gigahertz, <laughs> you can do that. But it's also really few photons because the, the numerical aperture of the spectrometer is quite low. So you also need quite long acquisition times. In that case, it's about three hours, something like that. But there is also new, uh, well, I just wanted to say that this is no more than uh, an interferometer and, and you can go at lower frequency if you increase the distances in between the mirrors and this is exactly what they do at Virgo. Okay, this is a really good spectrometer. But now there is also new uh, types of brilliant spectrometers that are based on uh, this uh, optical element. This is a VIPAS spectrometer. VIPAS stands for Virtual Image Phase Array. So you have your beam entering here uh, inside the, the, this uh, window. Here you have fully reflective mirror. It's here is 98% uh, reflectivity mirror. So you will uh, generate different virtual image that will interfere. And at the exit, you will have each wavelength will be um, will exit with different angles. Then you use uh, a spherical lens, and you can collect the light and make a spectra like this. And this company, Light Machinery, coupled this with a, a grating, so this is not the right uh, spectrometer. They change it a little bit since uh, I take this image. But uh, we have organized a school in, in January in, in Lyon for BioBrion, and they bring their apparatus there, and we compare it to the, our tandem fabric pair of spectrometer. So I show you the, the spectra obtained. So the smallest one is from the, the tandem. The biggest is from light machinery system. So this is a brilliant spectra of water. It's sound velocity. Uh, OK. And uh, you see so the spectra are almost the same. The frequency measured is almost the same. There is some difference because the configuration was slightly different. And uh, you see that the spectra are quite comparable. Maybe in, in the case of a tandem, the line width is uh, smaller, that means that we are really measuring something with tandem with light machinery. I will not use it for measuring the width of the brilliant peak. Okay. But the really good point of the spectrometer, when I need 50 seconds to make a spectra, they only need 0 0.5 seconds to make the same spectra with much more intensity. So it's quite interesting system. It's not, it can make spectra down to one gigahertz, I would say maybe uh, five. But uh, it's also useful to make spectra at higher frequency for Raman with one picometer resolution. So it's interesting. And uh, so this really fast uh, acquisition allows to make uh, mapping, and the it's used actually for biobrion spectrometry. I will speak about a little bit at the end of the talk. But these are examples from uh, Giuliano Scarcelli, who make uh, imaging of cells. So this is a, a, a cell, and he maps. Uh, mechanical properties of the cell using Brillouin, and he'll just look at the effect of um, different parameters. So he puts sucrose here, and he, he, he sees that the stress increases inside uh, the cell. Okay. He also make another experiment. This is an uh, eye, I think. So he's scanning through uh, the eye, and he's making the Brillouin spe spectra. So this is interesting because in that case, so what you're measuring is not only the sound velocity, but it's in index times the sound velocity. So in the case of an eye, it's a lens. You so you have an increase of the index and a decrease of the index. So it just checks that. Okay. Actually, they do things really better now. So in my case, I will use both uh, this tandem uh, Fabry-Perot spectrometer and uh, Raman spectrometers. And this gives me the opportunity to 
just discuss a little bit between Raman and Brillouin. What are the vibration of nanoparticles? Is it Raman or is it Brillouin? So you all know that the main difference between both techniques is just the frequency range. With Brillouin, you are down to 60 600 gigahertz, and uh, in Raman, you are uh, higher than 3 terahertz, I would say. Depends the definition. But uh, for me, the main difference is, is that with Brillouin, you are looking at a propagative wave, so acoustic waves propagating inside the medium. In case of Raman, you are looking at a stationary wave, okay, inside a bulk material. And the nanoparticles is in between both because it's like a solid but with a limited geometry. And it's, if it pumps in the low frequency range, it is like a large molecule. Okay. And we often say that we are doing low frequency Raman scattering because in that case, the, the waves is localized inside the nanoparticles. If I just describe a little bit more what we can access with this spectroscopy. So this is a bulk case. So with, some with brilliant spectroscopy, you can access the um, elastic properties of the materials, but you have to take into account the optical index. It's quite important. And if you nanostructure your materials, you can, it's just a scheme, just you can consider that there is a gap opening at the frequency of vibration of the nanoparticles that, uh, that is here. And uh, you will have a stationary wave, as I told you before. And in that case, we can also access the elastic properties, the crystallinity, size, shape, and I will show you. But you will do that independently from the optical index. So it's quite interesting to work with low frequency Raman on, on such object. So what are this, this vibration? Uh, so the first uh, description of this acoustic vibration of a sphere just a sphere, no matter the size, was given by a lamp model. So it depends on the shape, so shape and mode considered, the diameters of the object, the elastic content and the density of the materials. It exists many, many uh, types of uh, modes. So there is this torsional modes and this fluidal modes. So there is many types of fluidal modes. In the case of torsional modes with Raman, you will not be able to uh, detect it because there is no change of the vol volume surface modulation. So you will not detect this. And generally, with low frequency Raman, we essentially acquire this quadrupolar mode, sometimes a breathing mode. And these other modes are sometimes seen, sometimes not. And I will show you that we can maybe control uh, that. So let's go. Uh, the first low frequency Raman spectroscopy on nanoparticles was performed of on this rose metal surface. It's silver, I think. They were not looking at that. They just wanted to do cells and they look at the low frequency range and they saw this really nice spectra. Uh, that depends on the wavelength they, they, uh, they use to excite it. And they see this low frequency vibration and at the beginning, they didn't know what it was, and uh, they were looking for a long time. And finally, they, they think that their surface are uh, composed of many nanoparticles with different size, shape, and everything. And you will have different spectra depending on the resonance of these uh, nanoparticles. Then, um, well, this spectra is not really clear, but um, then in at the Institute of Light and Matter with uh, five monochromatous spectrometers, they were able to study many materials. So this is microcrystalline uh, structures in glass. So they also see that there is a dependency of this vibration mode uh, as a function of the process you use to, to make this glass. Uh, and they start to think that it was due to the vibration of the nanoparticles itself. And they then study many things. So this is in, in a case of silver particles in glass. In that case, changing the, the, the way they prepare the sample, they obtain two different wavelengths, uh, well, two different vibration modes, sorry, that correspond to different size of nanoparticles that uh, they are growing inside. So you have really the possibility to check what you are doing with Raman spectroscopy. It's a bit long, but you, you can do it. And more recently, uh, they also look at this, uh, so in that case, uh, there is a quadrupolar mode at really low frequencies, this is somewhere here, 
and you are also observing other modes in the case of silver nanoparticles. So in that case, it was a breathing mode. Okay. So that means with that technique, non-destructive technique, you can determine the size of the object you have really fastly. So it's already good information. This is another example. So this was uh, gold nanoparticles with really well-defined shape and well-defined size. But uh, they don't have the same crystallinity, depending on the, on the object you see, you look at. So there is some really crystalline, there is others that are polycrystalline and others that are amorphous. And you see that when it's amorphous, it's isotrope condition, the elastic property is isotrope, so you have only one peaks. But two features are appearing when the crystallinity change. And when it's crystalline, you have two modes. This is, I think, uh, E2GT2G, T1G maybe. So this is just because the sound velocity will be different within the orientation of the crystalline. So you can also have access to the crystallinity with this technique. And also you have access to the shape. So this is just a comparison. I do that during my PhD. So this is spherical nanoparticles. It's a quadrupolar vibration one of the spherical nanoparticles. And we, when we consider elongated um, nano objects, we have low frequency modes that correspond to the elongation of the uh, nano uh, roads. So this is what we measure. So we, we have different types of uh, nano columns. So you, we have all this mode, the quadrupolar vibration mode, also the quadrupolar vibration of the diameters of the uh, uh, nano roads. And here I just show you a comparison. So this is Raman, and this is from probe spectroscopy. So I just want to show you that the information are almost the same, but we do not access exactly the same uh, type of uh, vibration mode. So they also see this extensional vibration mode like us, but th in their case, they, they uh, observe the breathing mode of the diameters. In the case of Raman, we also see this mode, but it's more difficult to, to extract from the spectrum. But this is just to tell that these two techniques are really complementary and we can do really a lot of things with that. So we have access also to the shape. And uh, if you look at the literature, I think low frequency Raman scattering is used for many, many types of nano objects from quantum dots, carbon nanotubes, fluorescence, DNA to um, oxide, well, many things. And in this talk, I will really talk about this metallic nanoparticles, this kind of, and this kind of nanoplatelets. I will show you some examples. So what I want to, uh, I want to attract your attention on the fact that these nanoparticles are really simple nanoresonators. That ca the such frequency can be driven by their composition, size, shape, crystallinity, and uh, environment. And the good point is also that you can optically address these uh, nanoparticles, these nanoresonators, to detect that vibration. So when you are in a non-resonant case, we already saw that yesterday, you have spectra, it takes a long time, but in my case, I will consider na metallic nanoparticles and quantum dots. And now you uh, have this real states and you will have much more signals to work. This is mainly the reason why I work on this system, because you have more signal and I don't want to wait for two days to have a spectra. So with this system, it's better. So I will show you now a few examples on the work we have performed uh, since seven years. And uh, I will distinguish different things. It's measured on the same system in reality. So there's plasmon vibration coupling, vibration vibration coupling. I will show that with this vibration, we can probe the environment change. And I will discuss a little bit on the limit of the LAM model, uh, or just with an experiment. So we have seen this yesterday in the RAS talk. Uh, so this is SIRS. You use two gold nanoparticles. You put uh, uh, um, molecules in between, and you obtain a really nice picture because there is the enhancement. You are able to have sensitivity down to a single molecules. And my question at the beginning was that I will, will um, could I do that for a uh, low frequency range uh, spectroscopy? So here I consider uh, samples containing 100 nanometers diameters gold nanoparticles 
in a polymer matrix, it's an assembly measurement. And uh, you see that there is some isolated spheres that gives you this plasmonic answer. So I remember that it's the collective oscillation of the electrons, so from the single nanosphere. But you have also a couple nanoparticles inside the system that uh, make plasmonic coupling. And this is why you have a strong absorption in that range of frequency. Okay. But usually, we do low frequency Hermann scattering. We just want to see the vibration of single nanoparticles. So in historically, the people were always exciting at 532 in resonance with a single nanoparticle. And we need its work. We obtained this spectra. So this is a quadrupolar vibration mode of these 100 nanometers nanoparticles. Uh, so here it's one wave number, for the people who ask. And uh, we say that why? We have another plasmon, so let's excite this other plasmon, so probably this structures, we are not sure of that. So there is something wrong here, so normally there is another spectra in theory. So just to say, I don't know why is it like this, but we have the same spectra, but the intensity acquired is 10,000 times increased. So we have SIRS at low frequency. We are able to do SIRS with uh, low frequency um, Raman scattering. So this is already a good point. That means that if we control the arrangement of nanoparticles, we will gain time and we will be able to uh, study different things. Following in this plasmon vibration coupling, something which is interesting as the plasmon will, be, will have an effect is to consider these nanorods because nanorods are really interesting. You will have a plasmon in that direction, transverse direction at uh, low, wave uh, low, uh, low wavelength. And you will have another plasmon uh, in that direction. So that means that if you change the polarization, the incident light, and the wavelength, you will be able to see how the plasmon will couple with the vibration. Our main problem is that we need to work on an assembly. Working on an assembly of nanorods is quite complicated because there is a misorientation. So the nanorods will be in all orientation. And as we want to see really the, the dependency of the variation with respect to the excitation is quite complicated. But we feel, uh, finally found uh, samples to do that. So this is polar core sample. It's just polarizer that contains silver nanoparticles. So they, they, they grow silver nanoparticles inside the, the film and they just stretch it and they obtain such elongated structures here. So this is the plasmonic answer. So quality of the presentation is not as good. But here in blue, it's uh, the transverse plasmon resonance. In red, it's the longitudinal plasmon resonance. So from that, we know that there is a big distribution. And we make the Raman spectra, so uh, controlling the polarization and the wavelength. So when we use wavelengths resonant with the transverse plasmon mode, with this polarization, we obtain this uh, Raman spectra that give us the size, the diameter, average diameter of the um, nanorod, so it's fine, it's about 10 nanometers here. And if we change wavelengths with the same polarization, you see there is almost nothing. We are not exciting anything. So we need the plasmon to observe something. If we now change the polarization and keep the same wavelengths, we have a really nice spectra. So this is the elongation of the nanorod, so we are measuring really uh, the structure. So that means that we are able to tune, to control the scattering through the polarization and wavelengths we use. So we can just change it. But the problem of this sample is that there is a size dispersion. So finally, you have always a spectra in, uh, at short wavelengths when you keep this polarization, just bec because there is many, many different size inside this sample. There is no control. So this is complicated when we want to uh, know which types of vibration modes we are looking at. So that means that uh, we need to work with, I'm sorry, with uh, single nano objects. And uh, this is what I will show you. We are able to make SIRS, so probably you are able to work in a single nanoparticle kit. So I don't have a million dollar budget, so I will work with big things. <laughs> Uh, I work with uh, large nanoparticles, 100 nanometers. This is easiest to localize optically with our system. 
So that means also that it will be at low frequency, so we will use the Brillouin spectrometer, so it's 25 gigahertz uh, um, frequency, and we will need also to be resonant to have this uh, enhancement effect. So we really choose these nanoparticles for all three things. So to measure a single nanoparticle, it's a bit complicated if you want to be sure that it's only a single nanoparticle. So we deposit our nanoparticles on a, on a TM grid. We make a first imaging at low resolution to avoid any damage on the, on the sample. So we first localize it. We then find again the nanoparticles with uh, this uh, scanning modulation spectroscopy that give us the optical properties of the object. Finally, we do the Raman uh, on this object, so each time we have the same type of mapping to locate the same nanoparticles to be sure it's the same. And finally, we do the TEM at uh, really low, uh, really high resolution. So using this technique, we have all the important information, the optical properties, the vibrational properties, and the morphology. And with the uh, modeling and analysis, we can access to the plasmon vibration group. So let's start with this uh, single nanoparticle. So this is a single gold nanoparticle spectroscopy. This is its optical properties. So you see there is a plasma at 600 nanometers, so we excite somewhere, somewhere here. And here I compare the spectra with the spectra of an assembly. Okay. So the first point is that we are able to make this vibration spectra of single nanoparticles. It only takes two hours, I think, in that case, so it's fine. And the important information here is that the width of the peak you are measuring now has a real meaning. Because um, in the green, in the case of the green spectra, the width it um, traduces the size dispersion in the in the sample. In that case, we will have really a, a real information, and we are able to access the effect of the environment onto the vibration using this technique. The good point of our technique is, as I told you, we have the morphology, the optical properties, and the vibrational properties. So we will ab be able to understand how the plasma and the vibration will couple inside the system. But as I told you, what is interesting, and it's not to excite a single gold nanoparticle, but maybe more than this, so we start to work on uh, dimers of gold nanoparticles. So this is what I show you here. So this, there are the optical properties that depends on the distances between the two nanoparticles, as you can see. When they are real close, the longitudinal, well, the plasma in that direction uh, is shifted to uh, higher wavelengths. We always excite at the same um, uh, wavelengths. But you see on the Raman spectra, there is a clear change when you change the distance in between the two nanoparticles. And you see that there is more and more modes appearing. For the single sphere, there is only one mode, the quadrupolar vibration mode. But here you see appearing some new modes. And uh, these new modes correspond to the uh, higher order, uh, higher order vibrational modes in the nanoparticles. So this is strange. So why we are able to see this in that case? Uh, it was already observed on bigger nanoparticles, but we, it was more related to Brillouin effect. So why, in our case, we are able to see that? So I will just discuss this. So I do search. So this is clearly the, the, the CERS uh, representation. And what is important when you are doing CERS at, uh, at high frequency is the field in between the nanoparticles, because you will put your molecules inside this uh, field. In our case, the source of the plasmoning enhancement and the vibrating object are the same. So what is important is the field inside the nanoparticles. We have to consider the field inside the nanoparticles. So this is uh, an analytical calculation using uh, generalized mean theory and lamp theory. And you see that we are able to reproduce this spectrum in the case of a sphere. So we have still uh, this breathing mode appearing on our calculation. And this is probably due, probably due to the fact that we have to refine a little bit our code, because we have to take into account multiple scattering and all this stuff that we haven't done yet. But if we now consider the dimers, it's quite interesting. Because as you can see, as the uh, uh, field will be um, concentrated inside the nanoparticles, strong homogeneities will appear. 
and this strong inhomogeneity, inhomogeneities of the electromagnetic field are responsible for the observation of this higher order vibrational modes. So um, that means that somehow if we control the coupling between the nanoparticles and plasmonic coupling we will be able to observe one one type of scattering or another type and maybe we will be able sometimes to favor one of these vibrational modes. So it's quite interesting. That means that maybe we could make some nanoengineering. So this was the first part of that. So we are able to measure a single nano object. And there is plasmon vibration coupling that we start to understand using this experiment. With the same experiment, we can also look at a vibration vibration coupling. This is just an example from the literature. I think Roma has a poster on that outside. So it's just to say that when you put a, a, a disk of gold on the surface, you have to take into account that it will be able to couple with the surface. But this coupling will depend on the size and shape of the object you put on top. Does it will be the, the same in our case? We have our gold nanoparticles, they are in a matrix, so is there any mechanical coupling in between those two? So I already show you the spectra, so you haven't seen the red yet, but you haven't seen this too. So this was our first results we obtained when we excite at 647 nanometers. And this was really surprising. What is this strong features at really low frequency? So at the beginning we were thinking, so we are doing enhancement, so maybe we are measuring brilliant spectra of the matrix. So we make different experiments, changing configuration, wavelengths and everything, and it's not brilliant, brilliant spectra. So what is it? So we walk on our dimers and we measure it on our dimers. And on, on our dimers we have not one mode, but two modes at low frequency. So this was really intriguing because Normally, the quadrupolar vibration mode is the lower uh, frequency vibration mode that could can detect using low frequency Raman spectroscopy. The only other mode that could have frequency lower is L equal 1 mode, but L equal 1 mode is only translation of the nanoparticles. That means that there is no ra it's not Raman active and you, shon you should not be able to detect it. But we are not looking at a single nanoparticles. We are looking at a dimer. And in that case, if the two nanoparticles are translating in a, a phase opposition in two directions, you can explain this results. Okay. So these two peaks are due to the acoustic hybridization, due to the presence of the matrix, there is a mechanical coupling in between these two nanoparticles. And what you are seeing is this. And uh, this acoustic hybridization not only happen for this L equal 1 mode, but also for L equal 2 mode. Here I compare with a single nanoparticle case, and you see there is a shift of this vibration quadru vibrational quadrupolar modes, and this is also due to the hybridization of the uh, vibration. So uh, this was my experimental result, so I asked my colleagues for uh, modelization to understand what happened. So this was done by Aurelien. And, uh, we just look at this effect on the, so this is a quadrupolar mode, this is the L equal 1 mode coupled. And you see that as the distances will decrease, you will have a strong acoustic hybridization. But what is interesting here is that for half the diameter of the nanoparticles, there is still, we should observe acoustic hybridization. But nobody's observed it, and uh, many people have worked on gold nanoparticles inside glass samples where nanoparticles who are close enough to have this to observe this but the point is that to observe this hybridization you need a plasmon because this is what you are detecting when you are doing Raman it's the modulation of the plasmon in between the two nanoparticles this gives you the polarizability and this is what you are detecting so you need the plasmon to detect such effect so we are quite lucky on that the good point is that with this modelization that means that we are able to uh, uh, measure the young modulus of the matrix in between the two gold nanoparticles. Because this modelization have to take into account the, the effect of the matrix in between. So using this measurement, we are able to access this. We have still work to do. We have don't have changed the matrix yet, but we have to do that. 
Another interesting point, that, uh, as I told you, we are measuring the width of the peak now because we have a single object, so we have an information on the on the damping of the system. These are also uh, modelization from Aurelia. And uh, as you can see, when you reduce the distances between the nanoparticles, you will increase the quality factor of your model. So that means that we are able, by controlling again the distances between the nanoparticles, probably the matrix and everything, to make some nanoacoustic engineering. So we are able to make uh, nano opto acoustic engineering if we are able to place the nanoparticles a good in a good position. So it's quite interesting. So but I, I go fast because I want to show many things. So if you want to stop me, just tell me. Um, so we have this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is, that is exactly, it's resonant environment and what we detect at the end, so it's... Well, I don't know, because, uh, well, we have tried both. Uh, really, the only way to reproduce the, our result is to consider the field inside the nanoparticle. It's co to consider the field inside the nanoparticles. Because our, our uh, interpretation is that um, as you will have, a, a str you have strong inhomogeneities due to the vibration itself. Inside you have densities in homogeneities because your mode is vibrating and you change the density inside the nanoparticle. Sorry? So, so well, in that case, it's quite a polar mode, but yeah. That's right. You, you, I, I'm agree with that. But if you look, uh, it's true in that case uh, when they are really close together. So I don't know where I am. Uh, but uh, yeah, this was before. Uh, but when you are six nanometers distance, the plasma is not so strong. And I don't feel this is the reason why we are observing a new modes in that case. <laughs> <laughs> so to to it's difficult with this size of nanoparticles to have a good imaging to know exactly the gap. It's right. Uh, what we do is we we just measure the optical properties and we make a modelization of these optical properties and we make fits and we say that it's almost six nanometers. Uh, it's true. We don't know really what is the distance. These overturns are. In our sense, in the modelization, we are able to reproduce it only if we consider the field inside the, the nanoparticles itself. Because the homogeneity of your field inside okay, will be more sensitive to any displacement of the atoms. So, so this is what you see here. Different modes will uh, generate different uh, displacements of the atoms inside the, the nanoparticles. And if you have a strong homogeneity of the field, you will be more sensitive. There is more polarizability of the generating field. I don't convince you. Discussion. Inside. Inside. We, we have made the same calculation considering that the field, uh, as they do all the time, we, we have considered that uh, Generally, when they uh, simulate Raman, sp Raman spectra of uh, nanoparticles, they just consider that the field inside is homogeneous. And it's fine, you find almost the same spectra as this one. But when you try to reproduce this result, it's impossible. You, you can't, 
you ca you can't have this result if you don't consider the the, the field inside the nanoparticles. And it, th really, uh, our feeling maybe we are well, we are still fighting to publish this anyway, but. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that we are quite sure that if we are able to control this field inside the nanoparticle, we, we will really um, be able to change the types of mode we are, uh, we are able to observe. That's right. Yeah, yeah it's right, but with a brilliant spectrometer, you will not change the wavelengths as you want, because you would need a really good laser and your, your, your window is really sharp. But indeed, if we could change easily the wavelengths, this is something that we have to do. It's just changing the wavelengths and scanning over the wavelengths what happened on these overtones. Yeah. That's right. Uh, quadrupolar mode in Raman, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right, that all the mode exists. So thi this, I only show this out of phase mode because it fits our results. The reason is also that uh, if you consider the in phase, it's again a translation, there is no Raman activity in theory. So you we will not be able to detect it. We think that we should detect it because we you will have a small modulation of the, the plasmon gap, but the intensity will be lower. And we don't know, maybe there is other things that we are not resolving. That's right. But you see that in that case, it's really out of phase. And in, in a case of uh, quadrupolar mode, it must be in phase. But in that case, we really uh, consider just uh, uh, one type of mode. We don't consider the, the overtones and everything, for instance. But there is, all the modes exist. The, the, the problem is that how we detect it. And with Raman, we are limited to symmetric mo motion. I don't know. Yeah. You, you mean with with Raman spectroscopy? I mean, uh, it's con Okay, but it's another experiment. It's per probe spectroscopy, uh, probably, yeah, we will have all the results in there. It's a really simple experiment. I just shine a continuous laser on that and I collect a spectra. So. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> So uh, as I told you, so with this dimers, we should hope to measure the, the young modulus of the matrix in between the, the system. Uh, I will show you that with another system, we are able to probe the environment. And uh, in that case, I use quantum dots, so it's all fine for the to make resonant Raman. So people are work a lot on this uh, quantum dot sphere, so essentially to to know their crystallinity size and everything, and uh, our concern was on the shape modification because recently there is many chemists who developed really nice objects which are these nanoplatelets. And in case of these nanoplatelets, so we will see the breathing mode of the thickness of the nanoplatelets, but they can control it uh, uh, at the atomic scale. So they can control the number of layers of flatness and everything. And this is quite good for us because that means that we don't need to work on a single nano object, but we can work on an assembly of nano objects to give us more signal and it's interesting. So this is what we have measured. We measured two types of systems, uh, cadmium sulfur and cadmium selenide. Uh, 
nanoplatelets. So as you can see, when you change the thickness, you change the tectonic properties. It's normal. Uh, so it's 4 to 14 mi monolayers, so it's 3 to 11. And we just look at the Raman spectra of that. So in case of uh, cadmium selenide, you have to play with the wavelengths. So this was performed with our five monochromator spectrometers so this that allow us to change easily the, the, the wavelengths used. And you see there is a dependency of the vibration frequency mode as a function of the thickness, so the thicker nanoparticles have a lower frequency. As expected, so it was fine. We were able to deduce the, the, the thickness of their nanoplatelets. They were, they were quite happy to that. But in reality, we are not able to. <laughs> Because if we compare to the uh, uh, LAM model for this type of shape, you see that our data are quite far from the expected frequency. And this was really strange because uh, all the people have worked with the same technique on uh, ammo, uh, selenium mo uh, sulfur molybden and uh, tungsten selenide. And in their case, it fits perfectly. <laughs> so there is something wrong or in our measurement or in other things. So we have things a lot on that. And finally, we find that uh, there is a main difference between both type of system. In our case, there is an organic coating on top of the nanop nanoplatelets. And you have to consider this uh, organic coating to, uh, to, to fit this data. So we just check on literature, and we saw that in piezoelectric materials, they consider always the mass they put on top. And you have to consider the you have to calculate the frequency, you have to consider the mass of the uh, object you put on top of this piezoelectric system. We have done the same thing in our case, so we have this transcendental equation we have to find for the smallest equation. And uh, so you have to know the surface mass density of ligands, so in that case we just expect that all ligands with, uh, attach with all cadmium atoms, so it's probably uh, too much. We consider the bulk density the kind of the materials uh, of the nanoplatelets and the sound velocity of bulk. And the fit is quite good. So uh, we are able to reproduce this result. Okay, so this is the, the inverse of the thickness and the Raman frequency shift uh, as a function of uh, the thickness of the, the object. So maybe we have something like a nano balance. We are looking at the weight of the ligands on top of the surface. So to be sure we have a nano balance, you have to change the weight of the object you put on top. So our chemists have done a really good job. They, they finally changed all the, the ligands they put. So we have changed from octantile to octadecantile. Uh, so you see the mass is changing a lot and we have made this measurement and it was really nice because as you can see, there is a frequency change as we uh, change the weight of uh, the ligands. So yes, we have an atom balance, it's fine. But if we now consider again our model, so this is our model here, and you see that this is not as good as we expect, and there is something wrong here. But in reality, uh, this is, I'm a physicist and uh, the chemists are doing things, so they put tile on top and it's fine, and they say, yeah, yeah it's still five mono layers, it's good, but if you add sulfurs on each side of the nanoplatelets, it's not five monolayers, it's six monolayers, because you have alpha monolayer each side of the nanopart uh, of the nanoplatelet. And in that case, our model is quite good, still quite good. So it was fine, but you see we work with uh, quite thick uh, nanoplatelets, and I show you that the thinnest will be more sensitive to the effect of the ligand mass. So let's look at the smallest nanoplatelet and again you see that for the smallest nanoplatelets we we have a main a real difference between our model and what we measure in that case so it's fine for six for five it's almost fine but here we have a strong discrepancy between two so what happened here i told you that i use bulk density and sound velocity in the bulk because we have only these parameters in the literature you don't know the exact morphology and exact structure of your nanoplatelets when it's only three monolayers or four monolayers. So you have to consider that. And if we look at the sample with, so this is, these are the same nanoplatelets with two different ligands, and you see that the nanoplatelets with twists 
and this twist is different uh, as a function of the ligand. That means that we have to consider that there is change in the elastic properties of the nanoplatelets as a function of the ligand nature. So if we consider that, so this I, I just make uh, a little model just changing this parameter, so th we just change independently, and I know we can't do that, but independently the lattice parameters is we don't have any, f not so much effect for, for, um, for big mass, but uh, the elastic constant will have a strong effect, and we have to consider that there is a change inside, si this inside this sample, so we have tried to measure the lattice parameter, because uh, at least we do can do that, and indeed, you see that there is uh, two lattice parameters within the two directions. There is uh, um, in plane, uh, so this is in plane. Uh, that means in the, the large size of the nanoplatelets, you have an increase of the lattice parameters, but there is a compression in the thickness. So that means now we can't consider uh, the same elastic properties, and we have to to somehow determine it. So. For instance, using this uh, measurement of the uh, lattice parameter, we are able, using our model, to deduce this change of uh, elastic constant inside this system. And you see that it seems that there is really a big effect of the ligands, and probably it's um, the way they interact with the surface that plays a role, crucial role, also the length and their arrangement on the surface. Okay. So this is quite interesting for us because Finally, with this simple measurement, again, just a laser and a spectrometer, we are able to have a nanobalance with a good system and to grow up the elastic constant somehow. So there is still a lot of work to do on that, to understand what happened, and we are working with um, theoretical uh, physicists to, to modelize this and try to understand what happened. It's a breathing mode. This is really the signal, yeah. <laughs> Probably yes, but we, we are not able to measure it. I, I don't know how to do that, uh, for instance. But it's really three monolayers, I don't know. There is shear. It might be a, at higher frequency, we do not look at that. Yeah. But I, I don't know. We always look at the most intense signal <laughs> because we don't have. So, so I show you that we are able to, to to measure the environment to using this system. And uh, now I will talk about the limit of the LAM model. So I don't know, I will don't, don't give any answer on that, just measurements, okay? Uh, so until, uh, I would say last year, uh, people have measured really small object, okay, down to two nanometers, and this is a LAM model, so for quadrupolar mode and breathing mode. Most of the measurements have been performed with pump probe spectroscopy, and the limit was around two nanometers. So Natalia has shown you that now they access smaller nano, uh, smaller nano object, and that in that case we have to consider the ligands. Okay. Uh, in our case, uh, we have also worked on, on the same uh, object, but we have worked with the smallest object, uh, so it's six gold atoms and nine gold atoms, but there is ligands everywhere. So these are the samples, so this is just a scheme to see the shape, so it's not really planar, it's not really a sphere, okay, it's uh, something a bit strange, there is a ligands, but the good point there is that the chemists do that with a really high purity, so that means that we have, this is a mass spectra, we have only one type of aggregates in our powder we are studying. So this is fine for Raman, and uh, this has the spectra you obtain, so this is just result to discuss, but uh, we don't have any real, real interpretation on that. So this, uh, so there is some features due to the ligands uh, here, but the peaks one, two, and three are really due to the aggregates, okay? So this is a case of uh, uh, gold nine, and this is gold six. So this is, so the, the spectra are, are corrected. Oops. Um, so this, you see three peaks, and uh, so I will go quite fast on that, but if you report the frequency we measured, we consider that we have a sphere with these diameters, maybe not a good um, way to do that. But here we report our data on our spectra, so this is a LAM mode, LAM, uh, LAM model, I'm sorry, so this is a breathing mode, quadrupolar mode, 
and you see that the measurements we have done are far from the LAM model. Okay. But if now we consider that there is ligands everywhere, that they have mass, and we apply the simple model I showed you on the nano balance before, you see that maybe it's still correct. So that means that if we consider the ligands, there is still uh, the LAM model is still valid, which, which means that the elastic properties of bulk can be still considered for the so, so small things. This is really strange. <laughs> and uh, well, we, we, we don't have any answer on that, for instance, but we have to study it more. I just show you uh, to compare. So this is the same structure as uh, Natalia showed you Saturday. Uh, we measure it in Raman. We measure the same point, so that's a good point. Uh, we measure the same frequency. We have another frequency in, in our case. So as we think that the ligand has an effect, we ask the chemist to change the types of ligands we use. And the spectra change a little bit. We, we think that is, is due to the, the, the way the ligands are, are put outside the, the, the aggregates, but we don't know yet. But you see this mode in, in between here is due to the core of this structure. So this... Uh, 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 gold 25 has a core shell, pure gold, a core uh, pure gold, and a shell with gold and ligands. It's something different. And if we uh, consider our model, considering this type of uh, shell of ligands and gold, it seems that we can also reproduce this way. Okay. And we were interested in, again, to see if ligands has re a real effect, we have just changed the temperature, so we walk at ambient temperature and at lower temperature, and you see that the spectra is changing a lot. So actually, we don't know why. <laughs> uh, probably you are changing the, the uh, quality factor of the vibration mode, so we have to well, would like to go at lower temperature, but for instance, we are not able to do that. So this is what just to tell you that we can walk from less than one nanometer to 100 nanometers in mass spectroscopy on this system quite easily and have many information on that. But yeah, in that case, we will ha really have to answer many questions uh, to understand what happened. So I, I, I don't put it here, but I have a last example to show you. Um, so this big object, it's 300 microns. So 300 microns, it's well, around kilohertz vibration. So they didn't allow me to use Virgo yet. Um, so I will not speak about vibration of the system, but I will speak about acoustic waves inside it. So this is a biological system. This is a spirit of cancer cells. Okay. It's a model system that biologists are, are producing to investigate the effect of drugs on a cancer tumors. So it's a 3D object. And um, well, so I, I'm not biophysicist and maybe I will tell wrong things, but the idea is that uh, they know, the biologists know, that the cohesion between the cell is really important parameter. Because if the cohesion changes, the invasivity, invasivity <laughs> will be uh, uh, higher. So you, you have to access somehow the, the mechanical properties of the tumor. Okay? And then when you put drugs on that, we know that, well, they know that they are uh, changing the cohesion between the cells. So using Brillouin, you have a acoustic wavelength of 200 nanometers, which is almost the size of the cell-cell uh, contact. So you can normally access this information. So this is what we have done. So this is our still our measurement. So in that case, we use this type of things. So we put the, our spheroids inside uh, these cuvettes as well. Uh, we have many, many, because biologists like statistics, so we have to do statistics, and it's quite long. Uh, and we control the temperature and the medium. We put CO2, so they are alive, because our measurement takes some days. Okay. And we look at the uh, mechanical properties of the system. The first experiment we have done, so this is a spectra, so this is a culture medium, so almost water, I would say. And this is a tumor cell signal. So you see that we have to resolve things that are quite close together. And the first things we wanted to know if was if that if we were able to differentiate between two types of cancer, which would be already a good information. 
So this is what I show you here on the frequency. You can't di distinguish anything. It's almost the same, same frequency. But if you look at the line width, and this is why I told you that is really there is a lot of information on line width in breathing. You see that there is a change that is quite important, and it's different between the two. That means that uh, some of the stiffness of the cancer tumor is different. So using this method, we can distinguish everything. So then what we have done, uh, so we try to make mapping. We only do a quarter mapping. It's two days already. So we said, OK, stop. We will just take three points uh, in the rim, in the inter uh, in here, and in the center. And we just look at the evolution during um, several days. So the first result, just this these are non-cancer cell. Okay, it's uh, a healthy cell. So you see that there is a, a difference between uh, the mechanical properties in the rim and in the center. So it's a minimum information. Also on the line width, it's less clear in that case. So that means that in frequency, you have really the stiffness here, the viscosity. And if now we put drug, so when you put a drug, this is just imaging. At the beginning, you have this size, and you see that uh, cancer tumor cells is destroyed. So we put a huge concentration of drug because we wanted to go fast. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> so there is on the control, there is no s uh, dead cells, so it's fine. We are really an effect of the of the drug. This is just the diameter, what I show you here, the effect of the drugs on the diameters. And here are the brain measurements. So as you can see on D1, D0, there is nothing. We just put a drug. But after one day, there is an effect on the uh, outer part of the uh, spheroids. And uh, really, there is an effect just on the frequency here. So probably water is entering. There is some decohesion between cells. We don't know really what happened. And uh, if you look at the line width, there is many more information. As you can see here, the there is a huge change in the width of the peak. That means that somehow the cohesion between cells are changing. What I just want to tell you here is that brillion is quite useful uh, to measure such systems or biobrillions. Uh, they are making a lot of experiment, actually. And it's so interesting because we can track, for example, the effect of a drug on, or on this system. So it's quite interesting, and we will work on that. So actually, we are building a VIPA spectrometer <laughs> to go faster because we need really uh, to make mapping. It's biologists like that. But we keep the tandem fabric pair because we need to know the line width. And this is really important. So I have to uh, acknowledge all these uh, people, uh, and I will just like to finish on that. I have just updated a little bit because uh, people are never talking about low frequency, so I want to speak about low frequency. And with low frequency, you can access to crystallinity environment, mechanical coupling mechanism, as, as I show you. And this whole field of spectroscopy is still, uh, well, I would say, practically investigated. So we, we can still do many things with that. And with the new equipment, new laser, and uh, well, there is also stimulated RAM, and, and uh, there is many things to do. Thank you for your attention. There is not. That is, mm. yeah, exactly. I, you can, um, some people at the beginning try to consider that uh, you have uh, continuous mediums, that ligands have simply uh, different acoustic impedance. 
but doing that you are not able to reproduce these phase waves because you, you it's just you you have to consider that uh, acoustic waves propagate inside the ligands but it's not enough to to interpret what we have observed some people have done that on spherical nanoparticles and it was working but if we check a little bit what they are seeing uh, they are seeing the vibration of the shell of ligands that's right but it's a bit different on what we are seeing here in that case uh, silver will be really interesting uh, plasmon is better uh, <laughs> enhancement will be quite fine it's difficult to find good samples um, in that case we really need well-defined shapes uh, so our chemist prepares this gold nanoparticles with PDP matrix to have really matrix on top so we don't know how to do silver but if you have some silver <laughs> it's fine for us actually we are looking for working uh, on, on rods because we really want to work on single rods because as, uh, as I show you might be interesting because the changing polarization and wavelengths you can really place with the vibration you are measuring I don't think about that, but might be. But um, it seems. Well, I if we are able to measure the lattice parameters, we know more or less the crystalline structures. We can, uh, well with, with this parameter, we can inject it in our model and say that our model is perfect and that we are able to measure the, the, the elastic constant. Probably it's not complete, it surely is not. But uh, I think there is no other technique that, that can give you the uh, elastic constant of a sm so small uh, object. Might be, yeah, surely. There is an effect of the, um, we have also, as I show you, we have used, used style, um, uh, acid, oleic acid, and, uh, and uh, I don't remember the other one, but the, the chemical groups are quite different, and we have different effects, and the bonding will be highly different. With style, there is a real bonding. The sulfur will, will be uh, bond to the cadmium atoms. So in that case, I think th 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 there is a real contact. In the other case, I'm not sure about that. It's free. It's it's dried on the surface. Yeah. <laughs> we are trying to do that because chemists are able to to make stack, uh, and uh, we wanted to to see if there is a, a propagation or something. Uh, actually, we are not observing anything, but probably that the frequency might be uh, impacted by effect if you couple something uh, exactly as in a gold dimers surely yeah but this is also in the width of the peak in that case i'm not you i'm not using the width of the peak to, to say anything yeah 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 exactly Exactly, exactly. Surely, surely, I don't have it. You need quite good electronics to do that. But uh, doing a pterodyne spectroscopy in liquids for doing brilliant spectroscopy, you do that. Uh, it's 30 gigahertz 
so actually I think some electronics starts to acquire 30 gigahertz but not so much so you will be really limited to 20 gigahertz maybe for instance <laughs> but it will be really nice for us because no really lines but <laughs> quite good it's true <laughs> so uh, I, I have just changed but uh, soprano stands for uh, Optical spectroscopy for glass and nanoparticles. I don't know exactly. So I, I don't choose the name. <laughs> in French, in French. So we have extracted, well, yeah, well, at the beginning, we take the, the values of the um, um, uh, elastic constant measured from Brillouin. We take uh, our PVP matrix, we measure with Brillouin, we have the elastic constant, we know the index. And we just import this inside the model, and the model fits perfectly. So our idea is that if we can do that, that means that in the other way it will work. What I would like to do now is work with dimers but link with molecules in a well controlled way and measuring what is the elasticity of that. And if there is some elasticity, I don't know. People are doing things with DNA, it's fine, but it's in water and water and ramen are not really friendly at low frequency because there is a lot of diffusion. But uh, probably it exists system to do that. Our our main problem is to find good samples always. It's a discussion to have. Uh, 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 yeah. I, in our sense, it's really mechanical. Because it's really mechanical because if there is no people have already look at uh, dimers without matrix, so without no mechanical linking between, they never observe such modes. They observe such modes, uh, I think, only on the surface. But in that case, the, the mechanical linking is, is uh, the surface. Okay, so you put your two gold nanoparticles on the surface. The, the each nanoparticle would couple with uh, with uh, the surface, and you will have somehow mechanical coupling. But I, I don't think they observe such vibration in case of isolated gold nanoparticles without any mechanical environment. But it's difficult to do <laughs> anyway. But uh, I don't know. I really well, I have to defend my things, but. I really think that is a mechanical coupling that we have. But both are certainly uh, uh, coupled. This is why I, I talk about plasmon vibration coupling. You can't uh, distinguish both. It's difficult. You are not convinced.
pleasure. Ha, 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 ha.